Hello everyone, this is John Mark Johnson Jr. again, and today I'm going to be doing a review of the Greek New Testament as published by Tyndale House, Cambridge. Um, this is a relatively uh, recently uh, published text, it was about 10 years in the making, and um, it has its good points and its bad points like every Greek New Testament out there does. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through uh, some slides here of photos of my particular edition that I have. It arrived on um, Wednesday, and then I finally picked it up on, actually just yesterday, on, on Thanksgiving. So this is going to be a very fresh review, and uh, hopefully you guys will be able to get something out of it. Now, first thing that you'll notice here is I have a picture of the uh, slip cover that it comes in. Which is actually a pretty nice uh, thing to have, those slip covers. This is a picture from the other side, and you can see the actual book on the inside here. It might be a little bit difficult to tell. Well, let's see here if we can get a little bit more of a close up. Yeah, it's about the same either way. All right, moving on. Then, once I take the book out of its slip cover, I got the hard copy edition. And it actually was relatively inexpensive. Mine I got on Amazon for about $34, I believe. And so this is something that I would say makes uh, the Tyndale House Greek New Testament uh, better than some other Greek New Testaments, at least in this particular regard. Um, the Tyndale House Greek New Testament sells for under $40, whereas most other Greek New Testaments that you could buy out there, especially a lot of the standard academic ones like um, the United Bible Society's test or the Nestle Allen text, those are usually going to be you know, $40, $50 a piece, sometimes more depending on what, uh, what kind of binding you have and those kinds of things. And they're pretty well produced, and so is this one by Tyndale House. It looks like it has a decent binding on it and those kinds of things. Slip cover is a nice thing. But this one is coming out cheaper. And so for people who are looking at getting a a Greek New Testament and price is a major concern for them, this would definitely be one that would be in the running. Um, other relatively inexpensive Greek uh, New Testament texts would also include, um, oh, let me see if I can find it here. The uh, New Testament that is put out by, I believe it's Trinity, yeah, the Trin uh, Trinitarian Bible Society is one that's also relatively inexpensive. And then the Greek New Testament uh, is originally put out by uh, Westcott and Hort that has been reprinted by uh, Hendrickson is also a relatively inexpensive edition as well. So as far as inexpensive Greek New Testaments are concerned, all three of these uh, would be contenders. The one by uh, the Trinitarian Bible Society, the one put out by Hendrickson based on Westcott and Hort, and now this one put out by Tyndale. All right, moving on. Uh, this is just, of course, the uh, the inside cover page here. I love that they have uh, the starogram on here. It's one of my favorite early Christian symbols, and I love that it was incorporated. That part is cool. And then you have a bunch of folks here who are associated with Tyndale House, who uh, comprise the editors, associate editors, and assistants. And um, one of the things that that does, though, is it makes this uh, version of the Greek New Testament a thoroughly um, Protestant endeavor. If you've ever looked at um, the beliefs of the Tyndale House uh, Fellowship, um, they are very, very, very thoroughly Protestant. And so this is one of the, those texts that the, um, the King James only is can't claim, hey, you guys had, you know, Catholics and Eastern Orthodox people working with you on it, so it must be wrong. Well, that doesn't occur here. There are no Catholics or Eastern Orthodox people involved. Um, it is entirely a, a Protestant endeavor uh, through and through. And, of course, put out by Crossway, which is an interesting teaming up. All right, moving on from there. Uh, one of the features that is somewhat unusual about this Greek New Testament is that it does not follow the typical English order. Instead, it follows the order that you're going to find in most of the ancient manuscripts, at least those ancient manuscripts that do have all of the that do have multiple sections. A lot of the ancient manuscripts do not have all the the sections. It just wasn't very convenient to to put them all together. Uh, but for those that do, when they do have 
uh, the Gospels in them and the other epistles. What they usually do is they'll put the Catholic epistles, these ones here, they'll take those and they'll put those before the Pauline epistles, which comes afterwards. Um, and so this particular edition of the Greek New Testament does likewise. So you have the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You have Acts of the Apostles, which is typical in English. Some of the ancient manuscripts actually put Acts of the Apostles uh, towards the end of the New Testament. Um, but Tyndale House left it where it was. What is different is the Catholic epistles. So James, uh, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 1, 2, 3 John, Jude, all of those are put before any of the Pauline epistles. Then we get Romans, uh, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, uh, Colossians, uh, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, uh, Philemon, Hebrews, and then, of course, um, the uh, Revelation to John. I don't really actually like the titling here, and I know that there are you know ancient manuscripts that have the titling here, but it is technically inaccurate. The Revelation is the Revelation of Jesus Christ to John. Uh, this is Yanu, which would be of John, and it wasn't John who was giving the Revelation. It was him who was receiving it. Slightly misleading there. Um, but getting into a little bit more important details, they do have a preface, but it's a very, very, very short preface to it. Um, this edition of the Greek New Testament was definitely designed to be a reader's edition. They didn't want a whole lot of other concerns getting in the way of just sitting down and reading the text. And I actually have some problems with that because this was also put out as a scholarly uh, contribution. This was supposed to contribute to scholarship and a lot of the scholarly aspects are not as clear in reading the main text as they could be. Instead, you start getting to a real scholarly discussion, much more so in the appendices, um, after you've gotten through the text, and I think that creates some problems. Um, and I think that this uh, text overall, especially when it comes to a lot of the scholarly aspects, is going to wind up producing a lot of questions for a lot of people. And... But before we get into that, let's go ahead and take a look at what a typical page looks like. This is from the Gospel of Matthew. And you can see that it has a relatively nice font, very readable. Um, you know, it does have uppercase, lowercase, it does have punctuation marks, those kinds of things, which of course you do not find in a lot of the really old ancient manuscripts. The really old ancient manuscripts are unsealed, which is basically all capitals. They don't have spaces between words. Very little punctuation whatsoever. This has quite a bit of punctuation by comparison. Um, and so that is noteworthy. And then also you'll notice that the paragraph, bank, uh, paragraph breaks are made by hanging indents instead of first line indentation, uh, which follows along with a lot of the ancient uh, uh, manuscripts as well. That's a pretty typical thing for them to do. Uh, but it does wind up creating some interesting breaks that we wouldn't normally see in an English text. For example, here, starting in verse 9, you have the Lord's Prayer um, given in the Gospel of Matthew. And the Lord's Prayer ends with verse uh, 13, but you see the, the paragraph break basically continues on with verses 14 and 15. And there is, yes, precedent in the ancient manuscripts for doing it this way, but it's very weird for us to think of the, uh, the Lord's Prayer as something that's, you know, seated within a, a, another paragraph like this. We usually separate it out as a, a quotation or a statement or a saying on its own, and we often set it off aside almost basically as poetry. So the fact that it's being treated basically as regular text here is uh, a very interesting thing, and you see that throughout this edition of the Greek New Testament. Yeah, but that's what a basic, typical page will look like. You'll have the, the main text up top, and you'll notice that there are no scholarly notes in it whatsoever. It's just uh, punctuation, accent marks, those kinds of things. They do have a little bit of scholarly material down at the bottom. Great photo of my thumb. A little bit of scholarly material down at the bottom, different variants in the manuscripts that support them and that kind of thing. But um, it doesn't tell you anywhere in the text where those are. You actually have to look down here, figure out what the word is, figure out what verse it goes with, go all the way back to wherever that point happens to be, trying to find it in the text and figure out where it belongs. There isn't anything in the main text that tells you that a variant is there or not. It was designed just to be something that you simply read through. Um, 
and yeah, that's that's more than a little bit of a, a problem from my point of view, because this whole idea of the the reason why we do a textual apparatus in a critical edition of the Greek New Testament is so that people are aware of potential differences and you know the kinds of decisions that scholarship needs to come to and those kinds of things, but you you don't see any of that here. It's basically just a reading uh, edition. Um, happens to have this material here, but you really have to look for where it is in the main text and those kinds of things, because the main text is not going to tell you uh, where these particular variants belong and that sort of thing. All right, and then uh, getting to the back of the book, which, are, which is where you actually find the, the scholarly information, um, their explanations for why they did things is very cursory, to say the least. I'll just go ahead and read some of it here so you get an idea. It says, This edition aims to present in an easily readable format the best approximation to the words written by the New Testament authors within the constraints of the documentary evidence that survives. This means that the editors have sought to present the author's composition itself with the proviso that in seeking to reach this goal, we will not depart from what is contained in at least some Greek witnesses, we are naturally aware that our earliest extensive New Testament manuscripts usually provide us with New Testament books in a compiled form, and thus features such as the order or titles of books or the running headers are plausibly judged to post-date the first composition of the New Testament books themselves. Nevertheless, uh, we have not felt it our job as editors to go back behind the witnesses that survive. And it kind of goes on from there, and it also explains that this is a revision of the New Testament text of Samuel uh, Perdo Trigales. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Excuse me here. Sorry about that. Um, it explains that this is basically a revision of another work. And then on the next page, it goes on to explain that the revision that there has been gone that they undertook wound up being much more extensive than they thought it would be. It wound up becoming, becoming basically a, a brand new edition. Um, and the part that gets me the most, especially from a text critical point of view, which really was not the emphasis of this edition. This edition really was on reading it, and it was really on preserving some of the early orthography of, of the first millennium and displaying some of that early orthography. It really was not on producing a text that had readings that were super strongly supported, but nonetheless, they say this. They say, in keeping with Trigelis and documentary approach, we have sought to reduce the likelihood that any reading adopting adopted is a mere scribal aberration by insisting that our text be attested in two or more Greek manuscripts, at least one being from the 5th century or earlier. We have relaxed this rule somewhat for the Book of Revelation, owing to its more limited range of early extensive witnesses. We will uh, seek to give further transparency to our editorial reasoning and a textual commentary to be published subsequent to uh, this edition. Um, yeah, that's that's basically it. And granted, they go on to a few more details than this. Um, but you, it's very clear in reading their material on it that they really just wanted a reading edition and that the uh, fact that there are textual variants was very much so secondary in their thinking. And what they were trying to produce was a text that had ancient readings in it. It really wasn't a text that was guaranteed to, in any substantial way, um, guaranteed to have the most ancient readings in it. It was not, they say they want to pre uh, present the work of the original authors, but it really is Tregalus' work with um, some changes made here and there. And frankly, I'm I'm rather annoyed at a lot of the, the textual decisions that they made as far as textual variants are concerned. Um, I think they held too much to uh, Tregalus' work and um, didn't really let a lot of the textual evidence speak for itself. And they say here, you know, all of the readings that are in this book are early, in, or are early and that they um, at least come from uh, the 5th century or earlier. And that much is true. It is early in that sense, but it's still not the earliest readings in a lot of cases. 
and I'll get to those a lot of those specific uh, cases here in a, a few moments. But um, at best, their, uh, their um, explanation as to why they chose the variants that they did is just not very precise. I can't tell if this is supposed to be an eclectic methodology um, or or what it happens to be. Overall, when I read through the variants, what I get is that the idea is that this is supposed to basically be supposed to be the majority text of the first millennium. Um, you look through the majority text that's put out by a lot of groups like, say, Robinson, Pierpont, or, Hodge, or Hodges and Farstad, and those majority texts are basically the majority text of the second millennium. In a lot of ways, when I look through the variants that are listed here, this seems like it would be the majority text of the first millennium. It does a pretty good job of uh, representing what a biblical manuscript from the 5th or 6th centuries would look like. Um, and that's about it. As far as taking a real concerted effort to actually, you know, get back to the original, it doesn't really seem to be all that concerned with it. It basically picks up with where Trigellus lays off, makes a few changes here and there, but it really doesn't explain a whole lot. And a lot of the textual decisions are frankly quite baffling. So I myself am very much so looking forward to this textual commentary that is supposed to come out because I really cannot make heads or tails of some of the reasoning that they have here. They say that they want what the original authors had, they wanted it to be ancient, but some of the textual decisions they make are just weird. All right, and then this page, they say basically what kinds of things are going to be uh, listed in the apparatus. It says that variants that were in the eyes of the editors extremely close contenders for consideration for the main text uh, went into it. In some cases, editors were in doubt as to the correct decision. These are marked by a diamond. Like I said, again, some of those ones that they chose and that they thought were greatly debatable, you're not going to see most other uh, editors who would argue for early readings considered to be at all debatable. Um, for example, the United Bible Society's fifth edition um, gives, of course, grade levels to each of the variants that it has as e either an A level for absolutely certain, B for mostly certain, C um, basically average confidence, D below average confidence, and then diamond for we couldn't make a decision. This one still uses the diamond, but the ones that they list as diamond are oftentimes completely flipped from what the United Bible Societies puts forth. And there's just really no rhyme or reason to it. It also says that they put in variants that have a high exegetical importance. Fair enough. And they select variants which illustrate scribal habits. Okay, fine. But just not a whole lot of information on why the particular variants were chosen. Without that commentary, this um, edition of the Greek New Testament is going to be... I would approach it with a great amount of caution. Like I said... It does a pretty good job of representing a 5th or 6th century manuscript. That in no way means that what it's representing um, should be seriously taken as something that actually uh, goes back to the authors. They say that that was their intention, but a lot of the things that they do um, seems really counterproductive to that end. All right, and then also they do provide... Uh, a table at the back that gives the various manuscripts P84, uh, uh, the century in which it was composed, at least that they think it was composed, what it contains, where it's found now, those kinds of things. And this is pretty typical for a lot of Greek New Testament uh, texts. They'll do this one way or the other. Um, but the thing that surprises me is that a lot of the dating that they chose here is, is late dates. Um, and this is a, a bit of a conflict that you'll have within uh, textual critical circles is just how early or late some of the manuscripts are dated to. And you have people like Philip Comfort on one side who says, you know, there's actually probably quite a few uh, more manuscripts that could be listed as early manuscripts than we normally do. And then you have kind of the given establishment represented at Munster that typically gives much later dates for things. And you look at the dates that are in here, and most of them are the later dates. In fact, um, they only cite two manuscripts here at the and the back that they actually use with any great regularity in their apparatus that come from the second century, P90 and P104. Those are the only two second century manuscripts that they cite. And they don't really seem to, as you go through the apparatus on the various pages and the different variants, they don't ever seem to make a great effort to actually go with the earliest attested readings. 
their rule basically is we're going to stick with the, the Trigalis text so long as it can be found, you know, in the 5th century or earlier, except in the case of Revelation, because Revelation is a weird book and it doesn't have as much attestation as the others do. But that is basically their, their guideline. They stick with Trigalis, except where you can't find it in the 5th century or earlier. It seems to have been the model. And because of that, it, it represents a 5th or 6th century document real well. But to say that these are the earliest and best readings that we have for the New Testament is not the case. Okay. Like I said, they only give two 2nd century uh, manuscripts here uh, that they cite at all. And like I said, their criteria that they stated themselves was 5th century is what they were dedicated to going back to, not any earlier than that. Um, so it just winds up being a really idiosyncratic text, and frankly one that I cannot find good rhyme or reason for a lot of times. It's a nice reading text, which is what it was designed for, and the orthography, the fact that they went back to the early manuscripts and talked about how some things were spelt back then, those kinds of things, it's all very interesting, but as far as it actually being an accurate rendering of what was originally given, I find that claim really hard to substantiate, especially given that they didn't provide any additional commentary and didn't actually give a serious accounting of what their methodology was here. They didn't say whether they were trying to be eclectic about it, whether it was the Trigalis text that they just modified here and there as they found that it didn't have early enough support. They don't really state what um, their methodology is. And so it's really hard to get any kind of an idea of what's going on with the text. All right, moving on. Let's go ahead and get into uh, some of the variants. One of the first major variants that most people who study the New Testament are aware of that you'll encounter in the New Testament is, of course, the long ending of the Gospel of Mark. And this is one of the cases where the editors of this Greek New Testament, those at Tyndale, just chose to be as confusing as they possibly could be. So here's the ending. You have verse 8 up here, verse 9 down here, and in the middle they have um, a textual note that, that occurs in minuscule 1. And they also provide a, a translation of it down here. They say, oh, what, this, uh, what minuscule 1 says is, in some of the copies, the evangelist finishes here, up to which point also Eusebius of Pemphilus made canon sections. But in many, the following is also contained, and then it goes on to the rest, which the main text actually does retain. And so it provides a caveat, which is great, but then you go down to the textual evidence for verse 9, and the primary uh, uh, variant that they're actually in favor for, and that's what they said in their, their material on how the apparatus works, is that the first variant that is cited is uh, the one that they are for, and so they're for omitting the verses in the apparatus, but they're not for uh, omitting the verses in the main text, obviously. And so what does the person who is reading through this do? I mean, frankly, a lot of people don't read footnotes. Even scholars don't always read footnotes like they're supposed to. And so what are you supposed to do when you come to this? Yes, there's this caveat that's given here. Some of the manuscripts don't have it. Canon sections don't have it, etc. Uh, but it still provides the, the main text, but they're clearly not for the main text as per what their apparatus says. It's at best unclear. I mean, yes, we know that they are against it, but the presentation to the general reader, especially one who's not paying attention to footnotes, is going to be that, you know, hey, some people disagree with this, but we put and I chose to put it in there. Um, it seems very, very, very inconsistent to me and confusing, if nothing else. All right, moving on from there. Then in the Gospel of Luke, there were several textual choices that I just I found completely bizarre. Uh, let's go to uh, Luke 10 and verse 1, for example. This is where in many uh, modern versions, well, this is a modern version too, but in a lot of the more, we'll say, thoroughgoing eclectic texts like the United Bible Society's Nestle Allen, and I would expect that um, the ECM, when it comes out, it will probably follow the same pattern. Hard to know ahead of time, but probably follow the same pattern. But um, instead of describing Jesus as sending out 70 apostles, um, a lot of the other manuscripts will say that he sent out 72. We go down here to uh, 
the germane note here, so it's on 10 1. That first variant we're not really interested in. Here it is, the 70. And it lists the 70 as given in Sinaiticus, Alexandrinus, Ephraimi, K, L, W, etc., etc. And what's weird here is that they intentionally reject the earliest reading. The earliest reading has the 72 as found in P75, which again is just absolutely bonkersly weird. So here is the earliest reading, and if you look up in their, their chart, even according to them, P75 is earlier than Sinaiticus. And B, and usually with most textual scholars that follow any kind of eclectic methodology of trying to get back to the original who reject majority textism, if you have P75 and B together, that's usually taken as pretty much near certain. Uh, you can be pretty confident, at least an average level of confidence. This would be at least a C level variance in most other uh, text, but here they don't list it and they don't even give this one a, a diamond for being a close contender. The earliest reading that we have available in the manuscripts is not a close contender here. That I just find bizarre. That does not make any sense. The earliest available reading in the best manuscripts that we have is not even given diamond status at this point. And diamond status I would say that the uh, editors at least had a hard time making this decision. Is this just the, the Trigalis uh, text showing forth and they found some early evidence for it so they just left it in? I don't know. They don't really explain their methodology all that well. But at the very least, if they're trying to argue that this goes back to the apostles and um, the apostolic men who wrote the New Testament, it is very confusing because the earliest reading, they just rejected. Okay, so that is uh, Luke 10. A similar case occurs in Luke 22, in verses 43 and 44 in, like I said, you know, United Bible Society's text, Nestle Allen, which have basically the same main text. Um, those standard editions, and even in works like uh, Philip Comfort's commentary on the New Testament, um, he agrees that these texts are, are not original. But here, they leave them in there as original. Now, this time they did give the variant version diamond status, that is, they have the verses 43 and 44 and the evidence for them, and then they say it was close with these other ones, which again includes the earliest testimony, P75 and Vaticanus. Now technically uh, Sinaiticus comes before Vaticanus, but it's not as good of a text. Um, so again, they are rejecting the earliest and best witness that we have at that point, and I just find it so bizarre. And then you also have the fact that in uh, 69 here, it's omitted and insert it into a completely different place. A lot of times when you have a text that is floating around and being inserted in random places, it's usually a really good sign that it's not authentic. And that is completely overlooked here uh, for the most part. I mean, for them it made the decision hard because they put a diamond in there, but um, you would think that where it's such a dubious text, it's not in the earliest reading, P75 and B, and we know that it's being put in different places, that it can be inserted here in Luke, it can be inserted in Matthew, it doesn't really care, they were just inserting it all over the place. And that doesn't seem to figure into their thinking of saying, hey, this really isn't authentic at all, why would we believe that? Um, this is just bizarre, I mean, at least they gave it the diamond of it being kind of close in their judgment, but how close can that be? This is a really cut and dry case for most textual critics. It's not the early reading, and it's a reading that shows up in different places, and not just here. That's weird. I mean, normally an opening and shut case, but for them, it was arrived at with great difficulty for some reason. Um, Luke 23 is similar. Luke uh, 23, 34, you have Jesus saying on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that is a, a very dubious text. But they retain it. And they do list the alternative of omitting it as being a hard decision. But again, they ignore um, the earliest testimony. So they have P75, um, the first corrected reading of Sinaiticus, which is usually a very reliable reading 
Uh, the original reading of Sinaiticus and the later correctors, which is up here for inserting it, those are generally very unreliable, but the first corrector was a generally very reliable guy. And Vaticanus, all those, and even the original reading of Codex D, which is the kind of the archetype of the Western text form. So this is showing up across different kinds of texts, Alexandrian texts and Western texts. And then even in texts like W that are actually shown to be a, a composite of a lot of different text forms, uh, all coming uh, together. Again, this is earliest, best uh, witness, broadly attested, where, like I said, this would not be a big issue for most other textual scholars, but for some reason the folks at Tyndale House, you know, f somehow thought that this was close. P75 is either a late 2nd century or early 3rd century manuscript, depending on if you go with um, Philip Comfort's assessment of it or the typical uh, assessment of it that you get out of Munster. Philip um, puts it a little bit earlier than that. And you look, I mean, that is earlier than uh, the Sinaiticus citation by, you know, at least a, a full century, perhaps uh, two. And um, we know that Sinaiticus, that those particular versions of Sinaiticus are not as reliable as they could be. Other later manuscripts that are very reliable, like Vaticanus, just there's no rhyme or reason to this. I cannot see where anyone looking at this trying to actually go back uh, to the earliest and best evidence would think that leaving this uh, doc and this text in here that very clearly seems to be in an insertion would be accurate. I mean, yeah, they put the diamond then, therefore, hey, this was a, a close decision, but for most people, it wouldn't be that close. Like I said, P75 and B together is usually strong evidence. Put on top of that, the um, one of the initial correctors of Codex Sinaiticus, and you've pretty much got a rock-solid case for this being the original reading, but that is ignored here. It is just bizarre. And then one that completely gets me is John 118. John 118 is a text that in many modern editions and even many modern translations is a very clear reference to the deity of Christ. It says that no one has ever seen God. And in the traditional text form, which for some reason Tyndale House follows, it says that the... Uh, the unique son has made him known. Uh, the unique son is the one who has known the father and, and made him known. But a lot of modern uh, translations don't do that. Instead, they say the unique God has made him known as, in reference to Christ. And there's good reason for why they do that. So verse 18 here, you can see the reading that they chose. And then the other readings were not even close. There's no diamond level on them. The reading that they chose comes from Al Alexandrinus, C3, the third corrector of Ephraim Rescriptus. Um, these are 5th century uh, readings that's true, but we get into the other ones that have the typical reading that you find in uh, you know, the United Bible Societies, also in Philip Comfort's work and those kinds of things that a lot of scholars would go with today, uh, Daniel Wallace, all those folks would go with. They would follow these other readings, which would be either Haman Agones Theos, that is, the unique God, or monogamous theos, unique God. And the reason for that is because these are readings that are older than those ones. You have P75 and second corrector of Sinaiticus. P75 is very early reading. Um, like I said, it's either a late 2nd century or early 3rd century. You have P66, which is another early manuscript. Uh, the original reading of Sinaiticus, you have the corrected reading of Sinaiticus, and the original reading of A corrected, this is the second corrected reading of Sinaiticus, and the original reading of Sinaiticus going uh, before that. And so this is, you know, 2nd, 3rd century, 4th century, Vaticanus, very reliable manuscript, it's 4th century. Um, the original reading of Ephraimian Rescriptus is on the side of Monogenes Theos instead of Huios, and uh, manuscript L. Um, these are normally cut-and-dry kinds of uh, things for most uh, textual scholars. If you have the earliest papyri, P75 and P66, in favor of some form of monogamous theos, 
you have Sinaiticus in both its original and even its late corrected form. This is the late corrected. This is not the first correct. The late corrected form agreeing that this is the case. And Vaticanus, as well as the original reading of Ephraim Scriptus, that would be absolutely certain for most people, or at least really, really close to certain, so much that they would have no problem putting the monogamous theos in the main text, which is what you find in the United Bible Society's text, Nestle Allen, probably will wind up being in the ECM. Uh, ECM isn't finished for the Gospels, of course. Uh, they haven't done that yet. And then um, Philip Comfort's uh, commentary follows suit with it. For most people, this really isn't a question for people who go with the earliest, earliest and best uh, kind of philosophy. But for some reason, Dindel House didn't go this way. And was it just because they were trying to uh, stay true to Trigellus? Maybe. Um, was it because they happened to know something that the rest of biblical scholarship doesn't know? I guess it's a possibility. We won't really know until they come out with that commentary. But in the meantime, this is a really confusing decision. You have the earliest manuscripts and the best manuscripts supporting a different reading than the one they chose. Um, it just doesn't make any sense why they would do this. Moving on. Now here is a case where they did something that is fairly typical. That is, uh, their main reading does not have John 5.4 in it. It goes from 5.3 to 5.5. 5. And that is something that you will find in most versions and even in a lot of translations today. They're not going to have 5.4. Uh, and so that is pretty straightforward on that one, I uh, would say. Um, that's a case where they would uh, agree with um, conventional e eclectic scholarship. Um, but the other decisions really confuse me. But this is one that would be fairly typical. And so, yeah, the, the King James onlyists are not going to like that. And let's move on from there. Oh, and let's see here. Which one was this one? Oh, yes, this is John chapter 7, and verse 52 going into 53. And the reason why I bring this up is because here they they do not give uh, John 7.53 through 8.11 in the main text. It's not there. Instead, they put it just down here in the footnote, all of the, the words that have for it, which I would actually applaud them on. That is, that is... I, I, dubious text par excellence, uh, the Percipe uh, adultery, and I'm very happy that they didn't put it into the main text. Some of their other textual decisions, decisions, like I said, are really idiosyncratic and weird, and regarding the long ending of Mark, for example, it was very, mis well, not so much misleading as it was just outright confusing as to what they intended. They put the note in there saying that the long ending of Mark might not be authentic, um, and in the textual apparatus, it's pretty clear that they favor the omission, but they still put it in the main text anyways, which is just weird. But here, they were at least uh, fairly consistent. Uh, they favor omitting 753 through 811. You can see that right here. Omit 753 through 811. And um, they follow suit in the main text. So here's a place where they're wonderfully consistent. I applaud them for that. I wish they did that in the other places as well, especially the long ending of Mark and things like that. And... They're following the earliest and and uh, best uh, evidence. They have P66. Oh, sorry, wrong one. This is the one where it changes to another one. Um, but yeah, omitting it, uh, they don't have it in, it's not in P66 or P75, Sinaiticus Vaticanus, L, T, W, Delta, uh, Theta, Psi, and the original reading of 1424. Uh, uh, they are following the earliest evidence, best evidence, but perhaps the reason why it showed up here is that it wasn't in Trudellus' uh, edition um, because Trudellus had had access to some of these later manuscripts, and so he didn't put it in either. I, it's hard to say. I just don't know what their methodology was. Were they just trying to follow Trudellus and listing the, the variants where they uh, happened to be, or were they actually trying to produce something uh, that really did go back as far as we could go back in textual history to the original writings. I'm just so confused. I don't know what their intentions were. It's not clear. Okay, and then another little item that will just be of interest for folks is a Matthew 13, 18. 
this uh, Greek New Testament, like most Greek New Testaments, lists the number of the beast as being 666. And they decided to do it in numerical form, which is kind of cool. I wish that they had also gone through and put in Nomina Sacra, but they they didn't, at least not yet. Um, I would really like to see uh, Philip Comfort do a text of the Greek New Testament. If Philip Comfort would go through and do one, he would probably go through and do all of the numerics, do the Nomina Sacra, and he would also use the evidence of the earliest manuscripts uh, consistently instead of saying, hey, as long as it's at least in the 5th century, we're good. Uh, he would be much more consistent on that one. Uh, but here they don't do it, but they leave it as it typically would, and I expected that. Um, and frankly, this is a, a variant that's actually a fairly difficult one. You do have readings from as early as the 3rd century uh, that support the 666, but you also have readings that come from um, 4th century, and I think P115, if I remember right, is also 3rd century. I think it might be 4th century. Let me look it up here. Um, no, 3rd, 4th century, so it's late 3rd century. Uh, so this is actually a pretty difficult uh, variant, all things considered, because the evidence, earliest evidence, is pretty pretty close on, on which reading you would go with uh, for whether it be 666 or 616. Um, so I could see where they would just leave it as the default 666. And the United Bible Societies, Nestle Olland, uh, does the same thing. ECM may do the same thing or not. It's hard to tell. And when it comes to the book of Revelation in general, it's really hard to tell. Uh, just because the book of Revelation only has like two to 300 manuscripts that support it, whereas um, the other books of the New Testament usually have quite a bit more, oftentimes uh, double that or more. So it's a little bit more difficult there, a little bit harder decision to make. But interesting tidbit. All right, so what is my overall assessment of the text? What are the good points? What are the bad points to keep in mind? Well, good things is that it is comes with a very nice binding. As far as I can tell, Cross, Crossway did a good job. They have a lifetime guarantee on it, which is awesome. So it comes with a nice binding. The slip cover uh, case that they put with it is also a very nice addition to it. Um, it is also a relatively inexpensive text for a Greek New Testament, um, comparable to what the, the Trinitarian Bible Society or Hendrickson would put out for some of their older uh, reprints and those kinds of things. So that part is nice. Um, Getting to take a look at some of the earlier manuscripts orthography and see that represented is also really cool. And I think a lot of people are going to be happy with how that turned out. And I think that uh, Tyndale House actually did a very good job of putting together a fairly authentic orthography. Yes, they still used lowercase letters and accent marks and those kinds of things. And they said that they were going to. But they really did make a, a very concerted effort to try to stick as true to the uh, original unseal and other manuscripts as, as possible. And um, and those kinds of things. And it's also a very readable text. It has a good font on it and those kinds of things. Um, my area of concern is that they claim to want uh, to put forward the original text of the New Testament and there are times in the text where they clearly um, avoid the earliest and best readings. As far as I can tell, they basically said that, you know, as long as one of uh, Trigellus readings, which is what they base this on, it's a, an edition of Trigellus uh, readings, they said basically as long as it uh, comes from at least the 5th century, we're not going to mess with it. That seems to be what happened. Now, that textual commentary... Um, that would explain all this. I, I haven't seen it come out yet. Um, haven't had a chance to look through it. Maybe that'll explain it all, and we'll find out that all of the, the textual scholars up until this uh, point have just been dead wrong about all these things. Kind of highly doubt that. What I would expect to see is them coming out and saying, you know, we basically left Trigellus readings intact as long as they could be found in some early source somewhere. Whether it was the earliest and best source, but as long as it was in some early source. That appears to be what happened. Um, I might be wrong, but that seems to be that what happened on that one. So as far as being a text that would be useful in textual critical study, textual variance, those kinds of things, it's not really all that useful. It's very idiosyncratic. It doesn't go with earliest and best. It doesn't go with uh, pure majority readings either. 
Um, it is a really great rep representation of a 5th or 6th century manuscript. It would have the kinds of variants that you would expect in, in that time frame. Other than that, though, um, yeah, I would have a really hard time accepting this as being, you know, the original readings that the apostles and apostolic men wanted to have in the New Testament, or even a reasonably close facsimile thereof in many cases. There are some cool things that they did, like uh, taking the Pericope adultery, John 7, 53 through 8, 11, and putting it completely in the footnotes. I applaud them for that. Um, the way that they ended the Gospel of Mark was rather confusing as far as I was concerned. They say, you know, there's they put in the cautionary note from Minuscule 1 there. The um, apparatus seems to favor the omission of it, but they still left it in the main text. That was just confusing. Uh, but a lot of the other textual decisions, and especially John 1, 18, just boggled my mind why they would frequently reject the earliest and best readings just is weird to me. Um, so yeah, that would definitely be my problem. Textual variance, I would not trust it as far as I could throw it. But as far as orthography, which was much more clearly uh, the emphasis, um, readability, and those kinds of things, uh, being able to access a, a window of a particular history and time, uh, of a particular period in time does a great job at all those things but I am I'm not going to be giving up my United Bible Societies or Nestle all in text anytime soon in favor of this I just don't see it um, I'm not sure how you can justify rejecting some of the readings that they reject okay so lots of other areas it's actually a really great little text but the particular choices that they made with regard to some of the textual variants I cannot support so that is my assessment of the Greek New Testament that has been produced by Tyndale House, Cambridge. Thank you very much for your time and attention. For those of you who are in Christ, may you go with God and be blessed. For those of you who are not, I pray that you would come to an understanding of the true Christ of history, the only genuine Savior of mankind. Amen.